So I'm John Leitze. This is uh, this title talk. Uh, and that's a really wonkish title, you know, vulnerability remediation response, yada, yada. Uh, and really what I wanted to talk about today was how vulnerabilities in software are supposed to be handled. You know, not, not necessarily like the mechanics of how they're handled, you know, but the actual interactions that happen between the different people involved in the cycle and where, you know, the people involved in the overall cycle have very different expectations about how things should be done. Um, so you might ask yourself, why, why is that something that's worth actually having a conference talk on? Uh, I think the reality is there's like a lot of anger and distrust and hostility between different groups that are involved in the cycle. Um, it, just show of hands really quick, how many people have seen the, uh, the Nathaniel Rubin, the what talks about Perl? Yeah. Okay, well, like, if you, if you go back and, and watch those talks, you'll see that he has a lot of hostility towards the, the people whose uh, software he's talking about. And, and to a certain extent, some of that is, is actually merit. And uh, uh, to a certain extent, it's, it's over the top. Uh, but the reality is that there, there are definite disconnects between what different people are thinking when uh, they talk about vulnerabilities. Um, and for me personally, I work on the security team at cPanel. And our role in how vulnerabilities are handled is that we play the whole cycle. You know, so we find vulnerabilities, we deal with uh, vulnerability reports from people outside our company sending us problems, uh, and then we actually fix the vulnerabilities. So we have to you know, deal with the actual consequences of them. Um, and even outside of what we do at cPanel, we end up reporting vulnerabilities to a lot of other teams, seeing how their processes actually work. And uh, so we see ones that work really, really well, and we see ones that work really, really badly. Um, so before we actually get into the meat of it, though, we need to define two key terms, uh, what a vulnerability is and what an exploit is. Uh, and starting with the first vulnerability, we can go with any unexpected behavior in a software system that has a negative security impact, right? And the key parts of this are an unexpected behavior and a negative security impact, right? As far as it being an unexpected behavior, does that mean the person who wrote the software didn't expect it or the person using the software didn't expect it? Well, generally, it's the person using the software that's considered to be the one that gets to decide that. And uh, it's hard to tell what the person using it would actually expect. Uh, and in terms of a security impact, it's a very loose, weak term. You know, does it mean that it has to be something absolutely catastrophic and undeniable or is it something subtle? You know, like I can say, get access to something trivial that, that has very indeterminate consequences. Um, this, the vulnerability as a definition is just a very, very loose uh, uh, thing. And uh, there's a lot of room for debate, debate of what a vulnerability actually is. Um, on the other hand, we have exploit, right? So an exploit is a software or a process that uses one or more vulnerabilities to achieve some concrete impact uh, in terms of confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Uh, and the key parts here are that it's a software or process, one or more vulnerabilities, and concrete impact. Um, and so an exploit doesn't have to be software that fully automates everything. If I describe in detail exactly how some I can do something negative with a with a, a software system that in and of itself can be an exploit uh, and an exploit doesn't necessarily have to map to a single vulnerability it may be that I need 10 different vulnerabilities to to do some particular exploit process uh, the big difference between an exploit and a vulnerability though is impact right for an exploit the impact has to be something very very concrete and tangible uh, because like Really, it's not an exploit without the dire consequences of it. Uh, and they don't have to be, like an exploit doesn't have to be something that, you know, immediately takes over your machine. It might, you know, or it might, it might be something that's a more subtle impact, but, but clearly there is an impact there, something that you can rate. Um, so definitely a lot less room for interpretation when you talk about exploits. Uh, but the key part here is that vulnerabilities and exploits are not the same thing. Uh, 
And that's important because generally as software developers, we are supposed to work in the vulnerability lifecycle. We're supposed to fix, find and fix vulnerabilities. We're not really supposed to be working in the exploit lifecycle. Um, and inside the vulnerability lifecycle, everybody plays different roles. Uh, and the common way of breaking that down is that you have builders. These are the people that develop software. They take in vulnerability reports and analyze them, fix the vulnerabilities, and then distribute them out. You have the breakers. These are pen testers or researchers, people that, you know, they make it their regular business to analyze software and find problems with it and then hand those reports off. Uh, the breakers also tend to do a lot of knowledge sharing about how software can be attacked. Uh, so, for instance, breakers have uh, uh, very frequent and boisterous conferences. Um, the, the third role is the defender. You know, this is going to be generally an administrator of one type or another, maybe a systems administrator, maybe a net network administrator, maybe an individual site administrator. Basically, the defender is the person that's actually deploying the software so that users can uh, make use of it. Uh, defenders generally are supposed to do defense in depth. So say you have your network defenses, your website defenses, your system defenses, and so on. Whereas like a builder generally is thinking about one component in that whole cycle. Um, outside of those three primary roles, builder, breaker, and defender, uh, if, you, if you go to say an OWASP meeting or something like that, they're gonna put everybody in one of those three buckets. Uh, in my view, in reality, that's, that actually cuts out two important roles. Uh, the first being people that, that track the overall process. Uh, probably the, the most noticeable tracking group is, say, your distro security team. They don't necessarily find vulnerabilities, they don't necessarily fix them, uh, but they do track the entire process and help shuffle things along if they get stuck somewhere. Uh, another, another common uh, tracking group is say like your company security team. They may not actually fix any of the individual problems, but their, their job is to know that they're there and to make sure that they get addressed over time. Um, outside of trackers, a more, a more recent addition to the mix are brokers, people that actually are making a living monetizing the, the flow of vulnerabilities. Uh, and you really see that with, say, professional bounty programs where they're sort of aggregating bounty programs for a variety of companies. Uh, and you also see it with vulnerability feeds. If you're at a, a large company, you may be paying some other company to actually track what's going on, where different problems are in the life cycle, and tell you about it when those problems are relevant to your company. Um, and the two other roles that really don't fit into the life cycle but are kind of implicitly assumed are say a threat agent, an attacker, a hacker, a criminal, whatever, the bad guy. And then the users, the people that actually have something to lose from this process. Um, so like if we look at the happy path of how vulnerabilities get solved, right? Obviously we have a breaker who finds a problem. They're analyzing your software, they see a problem, they report it to the builder, the people that wrote the software, right? And the builder may go back and forth with them to figure out exactly what the problem is, how to fix it, yada, yada. And then they put together a fix, send it out, defender takes it, applies it, right? Uh, in reality, most of us are using distros, which are handling a lot of that effort for us. And so, say, if I find a problem frequently, I won't go through all the trouble of figuring out who actually wrote the software. I'll hand it off to, say, the Debian security team, let them handle all of the, uh, the effort of how do I contact the person who wrote the software in a, in a way that they want to be contacted? Uh, and likewise, most, most people don't actually install software directly anymore. They get it from the distro and they expect the distro to actually provide the updates for them. Uh, and if we add the, the brokers into this system, the people monetizing it, uh, generally the bounty programs are gonna sit between the people finding the vulnerabilities and the people that actually are fixing them uh, and the real role that they're playing there is that they're sort of filtering out reports that are bogus from the breakers. Uh, statistically, like the majority of vulnerability reports are, are bad, you know, like uh, the different broker companies that track it, their, their statistics are very, very high in terms of the number of invalid vulnerability reports. Uh, and then you have the vulnerability feeds over on the far right. They don't really interact with the process at all. 
Instead, they're sort of looking at what everybody else is doing uh, and then basically feeding that data down to the, the defenders so that, for instance, let's say somebody reports a vulnerability in some piece of software, there is no fix available. The, the vulnerability feed can tell you adjust your firewalls to make sure that it can't get through. Um, if, if you add money flows into it, obviously all the money's coming off the defender's pocket. You know, feeding back to the builders, to the brokers, to the people that actually found the vulnerabilities. Um, so if you look at that cycle, it seems like everybody's working for the exact same purpose, right? We want to find vulnerabilities, we want to get them fixed, get them out of the system, right? And if that's the case, then why is there so frequently hostility between the different groups in that cycle? It just doesn't make much sense, right? Um, and to me, like the, the problem is that we're talking about the vulnerability life cycle and not the exploit life cycle. And vulnerabilities are very sort of wishy-washy, you know? Like, it's not as concrete when you're talking about a vulnerability exactly that, it, that it's really a bad thing in a lot of cases. Um, and we don't really, generally speaking, you're discouraged from actually creating exploits for these vulnerabilities. Uh, most of the literature that you find about um, uh, bug reporting and security uh, work and whatnot says that you, if you see a vulnerability, you go ahead and report the vulnerability. You don't spend the time actually writing an exploit to go with it. Uh, and it, there are several reasons for that. One is that it is very time consuming to actually take a vulnerability and turn it into an exploit. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you need very specialized knowledge about the system that you're attacking to actually take a, a small security problem and turn it into something very concrete and tangible. Um, but probably the, the primary reason that you're discouraged from writing exploits is because the existence of the exploit itself creates more risk for everybody. That that, that exploit may get out and other people will misuse it. Uh, because exploits have a longer lifespan than vulnerabilities do. Uh, most of the, the networks that are compromised due to a vulnerability are compromised for vulnerabilities that are over a year old. Um, the, the reality is that the defenders take a very long time to actually remove these vulnerabilities from the well. Um, exploits obviously have a very different life cycle from vulnerabilities. Like in, in the, uh, the happy path, the breaker, maybe they found the vulnerability, maybe they didn't. They just, they just grabbed it from somebody else's updates. Either way, they turn it into an exploit and then they pass it along to a broker. You can find places online that will happily sell the exploits that you write uh, the bad guys get a copy of it and then misuse it against a user who uh, loses money. Everybody is happy, right? Well, not the user. Um, so anyway, the, the idea is that, that the vulnerability life cycle, finding vulnerabilities and fixing vulnerabilities, is supposed to basically limit the, the, the profitability of the exploit life cycle. We want to handle vulnerabilities so that we don't have to handle exploits because exploits are much worse to handle. Uh, but kind of going along with that, when you're talking about vulnerabilities, it, it basically makes these huge disconnects between the different groups. Um, kind of the, the first one is in terms of the people finding the vulnerabilities and the people that have to actually fix it, uh, there's a lot of, of disagreement on how, what you put into disclosing it. How much detail do you provide when you actually fix a problem? Uh, and also like whether or not you give credit to the people that actually found it. Um, on top of that, like whether, whether the attack, it, when it's in a vulnerability form, is a real risk to people, that's a, a very, very frequent point of contention. And of course, like how much existing functionality you have to give up to fix a problem, another point. Um, in terms of the, the, the people that fix the vulnerabilities and the people that distribute it, uh, obviously like the amount of detail again, whether the, a lot of, um, Developers, instead of actually fixing distinct problems, will aggregate them together with their releases. That causes a lot of problems for, say, the distros because they have to backport the fixes. Uh, and finally, like when the distros take it, hand it off to the people that actually are, are using it, how timely are these fixes? Do they have local customizations? And of course, like a lot of sites run into life software and continue to want support for those even after everybody's agreed they're not supporting it. Uh, but really, I want to concentrate more on 
the people that find vulnerabilities and them interacting with the people that actually wrote the software and have to fix them. Uh, and let's start with a real easy one. Like what sort of information goes into like the details you send out about a vulnerability? Uh, and like the most, the most tangible thing is credit, right? As, as somebody who, who writes software, fixes bugs and whatnot, you take in a lot of reports about problems and generally you don't thank the people for telling you that there was a problem in your software. Uh, but on the other hand, the people that look for vulnerabilities actually invest a huge amount of time to find these things. Uh, and, and, and like as we looked at the, expo the exploit life cycle, they could have gone down a different path and sold the thing. So basically the people finding vulnerabilities want the credit and uh, uh, the people who write the software generally aren't accustomed to giving credit for pointing out problems. Ah, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Yeah, you're getting ahead of me. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the key part here, though, like in terms of credit, right? It, uh, builders generally don't see the point of credit. Breakers generally are very focused on getting credit. Uh, and uh, as, as far as the amount of detail, breakers generally are, are in the business of sharing the way that they do attacks. They want lots of detail release. The builders generally don't want to tell people how, how the vulnerability worked, you know. Um, like in terms of uh, CVE numbers, the breakers generally want one. The builders, some of them will go and, and get CVE numbers. It, uh, does everybody know what a CVE number is? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Okay, yeah. Generally, it's, it's just the, the canonical way of tracking vulnerabilities and sort of when you get a CVE number, it sort of validates that it was a vulnerability. Um, and of course, in terms of risk, they're definitely disconnected. Uh, my, my suggestion is though, as far as disclosure and credit, uh, if you're a breaker, just assume that, that the builder will not do it correctly, although a lot of people do great jobs in terms of actually announcing vulnerabilities when they fix them. Uh, there are going to be people that don't, and you don't have to worry about that at all. You can get a CVE number if they didn't ask for one, and you can do your own write-up totally independent of theirs. Uh, for If you're writing software, though, just expect that, that, that if you don't do these things, the person who found the problem can turn right around and do them for you. So as soon as you find something that you think is a vulnerability, go ahead and request the CVE number you know, before you send it out. Then you're going to have it right in your change log. Everybody's talking about the exact same thing. Uh, and definitely give credit. Uh, it seems kind of a silly thing to get caught up on, but I, I've reported hundreds of vulnerabilities and I think I've been credited for maybe a third. Uh, out of the other two thirds, half of them are credited to the wrong person. Like, that, it's odd, but it's the reality. Like, uh, uh, so it just helps. If, you, if you're the one fixing the software, credit the person that actually found it. Um, and I think another important point though is that uh, for the, when you're building software and fixing vulnerabilities, you kind of have this expectation that the secrecy involved in the process of reporting it and discussing it uh, is going to exist afterwards, and that's not the case generally. Uh, so basically, don't don't pin your expectations on that. Uh, I think the the stronger disconnect though is whether or not um, uh, the risk involved in a vulnerability is actually a real risk. Uh, and there are two ways of thinking about this. One of them, I kind of came up for the folks at cPanel, and it, and it goes off this chart. Uh, hopefully, I'll read that. Uh, but basically, if we plot out everything that the so uh, software, a piece of software actually does, and we plot it out in terms of, did the developer intend for this thing to happen? Uh, and then plot it on the other axis of, how does the user actually encounter this, this particular behavior? Right? And we start throwing things into these different buckets, right? So up here, things that the developer intended and that the user experiences very naturally. These are your features, right? These are the things you, you're selling your software as what it does, right? These things that uh, the user experiences very naturally but you didn't intend to happen, those are bugs, right? It's very obvious. This actually happens to people and I didn't want it to happen. Um, down here, the things that you intended but the user encounters in a very unnatural way. 
These are your limitations or use, your user usability problems. Uh, and then in this last corner, things that you didn't intend to happen and that users have to do something very odd for it to happen in the first place, these are quirks, you know? Uh, let's say your, your quality assurance guy is continually pointing out things that nobody is likely to do and that you didn't intend for them to happen. Sure, they're bugs, but who cares? Nobody's gonna do them, right? Uh, the problem is that a lot of vulnerabilities end up in this very bucket. You know, there are things that you didn't intend to happen, they are very unlikely for somebody to actually do. Uh, so as a developer, I, when you look at these problems, you think to yourself, you know, that it's just something stupid, who cares, you know? But the flip side is that if, if it happening gives the person it happens to some sort of advantage, then it's not really a quirk anymore, now it's a vulnerability. And instead of being something that is totally forgettable, it's something that you're supposed to handle with even more care than a regular bug. You know, it's a very odd combination. Uh, so it's natural that developers will tend to look at it more like a quirk and say the people that find it are thinking this is something, you know, spectacular. It's much more important than, than just your average bug. Uh, Another thing I like about this, this way of sort of visualizing it though is that if you sort of improve the quality of your software altogether, sort of get rid of the, the undefined and unexpected behaviors, and let's say you improve the usability, you get rid of all that unnatural interaction with it, uh, you sort of squeeze out those quirks and vulnerabilities at the same time. Um, the other way of kind of looking at this disconnect in terms of evaluating the risk of things uh, this is a paper by uh, Kelly Shortridge, um, which goes into prospect theory, which is an economic model for, for sort of quantifying how people evaluate risk and make decisions in the face of risk. Uh, and a really great example of prospect theory. So imagine you have two choices. You can have 100% chance of getting $3,000 or you can have an 80% chance of 4,000 and a 20% chance of getting nothing, right? If you actually do the math, uh, uh, choice B is the better choice. It has an average payout of $3,200. But the reality is most people will choose choice A. 80% uh, will choose choice A. Uh, and if we flip this on its head, so like you have 100% chance of losing 3,000 or 80% 4,000, 20% of losing nothing, right? Uh, choice A is clearly the better choice here. The choice B has an average loss of 3,200. Uh, choice B will be the choice of 92% of people, um, even though it is the worst choice. Uh, and what, what prospect theory is about is that in terms of gain, people are actually averse to taking risks, even when those risks are advantageous to them. And in terms of loss, people will take unrealistic risks to, with, a, with a small prospect of avoiding all loss. Um, and in this, the paper I mentioned, uh, she relates this to the concept of attackers and defenders. Attackers will generally uh, be very averse to taking risks. They wanna take the sure things. And defenders will actually take a lot of risks that are, that are unmerited in the hope that it'll work out for them. Uh, and I think that, that concept, if you actually apply it to the disconnect between people finding vulnerabilities and people writing software and their interactions together, uh, you actually find that the, the people finding vulnerabilities tend to think in terms of profit, like the, the exploit itself is some sort of profit, and so they tend to be very averse to any sort of risk. Uh, whereas the people building the software tend to think, well, this may happen, but I, I expect that it generally wouldn't. Uh, they tend to be more risk-seeking, risk risk-embracing. Uh, and if we actually look in terms of uh, when the fix is, is uh, created, will it break existing behaviors? It actually flips right on its head. Breakers tend to look at this more as eliminating uh, the, the, the loss incurred by the vulnerability, and so they tend to embrace the risk of regressions more Builders tend to look at this more as fixing the software and so are much less willing to take risks in the fix. Um, so to kind of kind of summarize it again, uh, the, the breakers are more, uh, more, they tend to overinflate the risk of uh, a vulnerability and underinflate the risk of regressions and fixes. 
and builders tend to be the exact opposite. Uh, and this is really important because when you're talking about vulnerabilities, the risk is very, is very poorly defined, right? Uh, personally, I think like you shouldn't really think in terms of vulnerabilities, think in terms of exploits. Like at cPanel, we basically n never look at things as vulnerabilities anymore. We always spend the time actually writing exploits for virtually all of the problems we find in our code. And I wanna walk through an example which I think really drills this in. Uh, this is a vulnerability in movable type, uh, which if you don't know about it, it's blogging engine, written in Perl, simple CGI uh, with active record kind of underpinning everything. Uh, and the core part of it, hopefully everybody can read that, uh, is this build page and mem function, right? I've looked at movable type an awful lot. Uh, when I saw this, this is the, the actual function that does the, the rendering. Uh, the template output is where it's gonna either take HTML template or template toolkit and generate the page. And then after that, it does two more steps, process MT template and translate templatized, right? Uh, this means that the output process has three different stages with the user's data mixed in with the uh, sort of the control data in the first stage. Uh, to me, this immediately pops out, uh, it, it hits my spidey senses and says that's wrong uh, because I fixed actually several other vulnerabilities that were this same sort of problem where you have a multi-stage process, you take the untrusted data and then intermix it with your control data at the first stage and then you basically target the, the later stages in the process. Uh, and in this case, the translate templatized, if you read up here, it basically looks for the special markup in the output with angle bracket, trans phrase, yada yada, and there's a make text phrase inside of there, uh, which also stands out to me because I've actually spent a lot of time looking at make text. So personally, I look at this and I say, that's pretty clearly a vulnerability. If I really felt confident that the, the people that I would report it to would understand all of the nuances of how such a vulnerability would work, I would just send it off and be done with it. I honestly don't expect most people would understand that. Uh, so I don't look at it as a vulnerability report and I think how can I actually turn this into an exploit, right? So the input point that I need is something that allows angle brackets through, uh, which in terms of a web app, angle brackets generally mean that it's a cross-site scripting injection, right? I need angle brackets for that in most cases. And then on the flip side, that gets me all the way into make text. I need some sort of attack for make text, uh, although those are pretty easy to come by. So to find an XSS injection, uh, this is something I had, I had used in earlier reports against movable type. This is the configuration interface that runs the very first time you load up a movable type website, uh, mtwizard.cgi. And every time you load it after that, it tells you there's already a configuration file. I don't do anything. Uh, but if you look at the code that actually implements this, uh, it says, well, if the configuration file exists and I don't have these particular flags, then I, I present that page. Otherwise, I'm gonna actually go into the wizard. Um, and I actually ran into this when I was reporting a storable injection of movable type and so it makes an easy way to get into this interface like this. Just provide a couple extra parameters and I get to the middle stages of the wizard interface, which generally speaking isn't very interesting except it's a one-time wizard interface and so it's really easy to find an XSS flaw inside of it. Uh, a, a web page that only runs one time generally is not gonna be very secure. Nobody looks at it, you know? So that gets me half of it. I have an XSS flaw it gets me all the way to that build page in mem with angle brackets in it, right? Uh, so now I need a make text attack to go with it. And if you haven't really worked with locale make text before, it uses this special square bracket syntax. And those square brackets end up being method calls on the locale handle. So just like that. Uh, what's weird about locale make text is that the, that square bracket syntax those are all method calls, but locale make text doesn't really care what type of method calls they are. So I can call new inside of there. I can call, you know, basically any, any method that's valid on that thing, I can call it inside of a square bracket. And so the, my go-to attack for these, because I've actually done a lot of them, cPanel uses make text, and so we get a lot of 
uh, places where it's exploitable, is that I actually trigger the failure logic for locale make text uh, by setting this fail with, right? Normally that's something you would call in the object itself. It has no business being inside of a translatable phrase, but locale make text will be happy to deal with it if you stick it in one. So basically I set some other function to be what it fails with and then I'll end up in that function. The first argument is going to be the locale make text object because it's a method call. The second argument has to begin with an underscore just so that it's a failure to get there. Uh, so I need something in movable type that will actually accept those two and then go on and do something bad. That's pretty easy to find generally. Like this is run app and if you trace, let's trace the second call which is class, it's all the way down to that string require right there. So anything with a leading underscore that'll do something bad at that point, right? Uh, and here's a different one, handler to code ref. Uh, you see that second argument and it gets down to that sub call right there. Uh, right underneath this, it's not on the slide, but is another string of L that'll, that'll basically do the same thing as run app. Uh, so basically I need to send a payload, one translation that says fail with this other function and then I send uh, a second translation that will immediately fail and then go to that function. Uh, and in fact, because it's make text, I can combine the two, get make text to run make text so that it does two make text calls with both my setup and my actual trigger. Um, and then taking all those pieces together, I get this huge URL, which sends me to the MT wizard page on like a middle step of initial setup and then injects these make text calls into it. Uh, in this case, it's doing a directory listing of slash and catting the Etsy password file. I load it and obviously I get to see that it works. Um, and of course, I can easily write up a Metasploit module so that you just plug in your parameters and there it goes, right? Um, but the key point here, outside of that, that's already fixed, right? The key point is if you look at all the steps that are involved here, all the little tiny mistakes that you could, you could say each and every one of them is forgivable in and of itself, right? It's very hard to say that e any one of those mistakes was actually a vulnerability, you know? You can look at the exploit and it's clear, clear as day that that exploit is basically as bad as you can get, you know? I mean, unauthenticated code execution. Uh, but where in all these different steps do you say the actual problems happened? You know, and personally, I would say the fact, say number one, the fact that I can get to step three of five in initial setup is, is a vulnerability. I mean, it's one without much consequence in and of itself, but it's a vulnerability, you know. And the XSS in a screen that's only run one time by the person who has complete control of the website, like, is it, is it bad enough to fix? I don't know. I, I mean, but still, it shouldn't be there. It's, it's also kind of that way. Um, so really my suggestion is that if you are reporting vulnerabilities, don't report, don't stop when you see the first problem, you know, actually present the problem in its most, the worst form you can imagine to the person that has to fix it. Because they will have a tendency to underappreciate the consequences of not fixing small problems as they come along. Uh, and on the flip side, if you are actually receiving these reports and you get reports where somebody says, well, this can happen and I don't know what actually happens with it. You know, read it in the most liberal possible terms and assume that the person who finds out this can, can maximize the damage they can do with it. Uh, and to be honest, I, I say, because we've actually had this problem at cPanel where, where, you know, when we say, well, we don't think that's a vulnerability, uh, people get very hostile and go very public in saying that we're wrong and we're stupid and that we're just downplaying everything. Uh, so personally, I, I like to go even beyond that. Like, let's assume that not only the person who reported it, they weaponize it to the fullest extent they could possibly do it. But then they, they get a website, they create a logo, they send out press releases, all of which are presenting it in very skewed terms and making us look as bad as possible, right? It, assuming all that happens, would we actually do something different? Like, would you go back and change it just because so much heat was drawn down on you? 
And if, if the answer is that yes, you would go and change it if everybody pointed a finger at it and started screaming at you, then probably you should just accept it as a vulnerability and fix it and move on. You know, it's simpler uh, because although that will very, very rarely happen that somebody gets so upset at you that they go through all that trouble, when it does, you look terrible, you know? So just don't put yourself in that position. It also uh, gives the person who's reporting it a, a certain amount of power over you that they can basically, not, not extortion, but sort of they can, they can apply pressure to you with the threat of doing such a thing. Uh, so I think like when you're evaluating it, sort of assume these things, assume the worst possible conditions, and it actually will counterbalance your tendency to underrate the severity of problems. Um, Actually, I'm doing pretty well on time. Uh, as far as like once you fix a problem and you ship it out, uh, there are obviously some disconnects in the ways that people who produce software and people that redistribute software uh, tend to expect things. Like say the, uh, the people that fix the, the software will tend to skew all the way between denying the existence of a vulnerability when they fix it. A lot of people do this, you know, or going the totally opposite direction and sort of latching onto it as a unique snowflake that the, the world is gonna end when, uh, unless everybody updates immediately. Uh, and in, in reality for the distros, they deal with a whole lot of vulnerabilities, you know, like there is no one piece of software where the problem in it is going to be the make or break moment for the distro. Every single day they see new vulnerabilities, you know, so your piece of software and the problem in your piece of software is not the unique snowflake. Um, the, the distros also obviously have a big problem if you bundle up your vulnerability fixes along with other changes and they're left to sort out what was the vulnerability fix and what was totally unrelated because in most cases they have to backport it. Um, yeah, and uh, I already mentioned the, the frequency. So in terms of how you can make things nicer for, for the distros and other trackers, uh, definitely get a CVE number. If you don't know how to get a CVE number, it is very simple. Just email CVEassign at MITRE.org. They will gladly hand it out if you are the person that wrote the software. They're really not going to debate with you. If you're finding vulnerabilities, they will probably want to debate with you a little bit. Uh, especially if they think it's kind of sketchy. Um, MITRE has had like a, a sort of a bad history about actually taking in these emails and not responding in a timely fashion. Uh, the Debian security team, the second contact, if your software is in Debian, they will be glad to give you a CVE number and work with you to fix it. Uh, so I would definitely suggest contacting them if you already know that it's, that it's picked up by Debian. Um, when you do release the fix, definitely Mention the CVE number. I can't overstate how, how nice it is if you get those because it basically lets everybody else see that there was a vulnerability. It puts it into all their trackers. Basically, all these websites that have this problem, they're going to get flagged by their PCI compliance auditors because they know about the CVE numbers. They don't know about much beyond that, but they will know about the CVE number. You know, uh, And definitely in your announcement, you know, explain the scope of who would be at risk of the vulnerability and what sort of things they could do to mitigate it. Say with the, uh, the movable type one we looked at, obviously it depended on the MT wizard interface. There are probably other ways to do it because all we needed was a, a uh, XSS to get to it, but removing that interface clearly defanged that exploit if you just did that. Um, and uh, we already mentioned credit. Uh, severity, that, that can be kind of tricky. Like. Uh, I, at cPanel, we use the standard CVSS V2 uh, uh, severity scoring. Uh, some companies do CVSS V3. There are little calculators that walk you through exactly how to score it. If you generally don't deal with vulnerabilities, I would say like if you want to give it a severity to let people know, you know, whether or not it's worth getting concerned about. Because to be honest, some vulnerabilities aren't worth really getting concerned about. I would go and grab one of those calculators and plug in your stuff, put the number in there and the little markup for uh, all of the, the metrics that you gave it that rating with. Um, and definitely provide your security fixes as a patch, uh, especially if your software is in the distros. 
because they are not going to want your new releases. They're actually going to want to fix the vulnerability in the existing release. Uh, we had uh, some great interactions with the Exum maintainers when we reported a flaw to them. Uh, they went so far as going to all of the end of life versions that virtually anybody was using and backporting their fixes to those versions. You know, for coordinating with all the people using those end of life versions to make sure they had everything they need to roll out the patch. Uh, which made great sense because as soon as they released their vulnerability that we reported, like within a few hours, people were on Twitter talking about how to, how to root boxes with it. Uh, so it was, it, although it was a local exploit and so not that severe, the reality is it was pretty easy to actually trigger it and take over a machine with it. Um, so that's, that's what I got. Uh, if, uh, if you want to contact me and follow up on it, like there's my email address, my Twitter, uh, this website, pearlsec.org, I've actually uh, been writing up some of the Perl vulnerabilities that I've found outside of work on that website. It's really, really ugly, uh, but that will get better. And I, I will actually write up this, this uh, make text movable type flaw on there. Um, so any questions, comments, anything? Yes? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, uh, let me, I, I'll repeat it just for everybody else. So the, the question was that essentially in producing an exploit for that one three phase rendering problem that I found, I essentially found other vulnerabilities in the process. And so do they get sliced up as multiple vulnerabilities? Uh, that would totally depend on who you report it to. Now let's say, let's say you found a 10 part vulnerability in Chrome to actually go from a web page to executing code on somebody's machine, right? Uh, that, that browses the web page. Google would slice that up as 10 vulnerabilities. Uh, because if you look at the, the Pony Awards, that's generally the case. That any single attack involves multiple things that they're calling vulnerabilities. Uh, in this case with that movable type flaw, no. That was announced as a single vulnerability and uh, it targeted one specific part of that entire chain of how, how it worked. Um, I mean, the reality is the, the, the people that write software have control over their own stuff, you know? Like cPanel has control over what cPanel writes, you have control over what you write. Uh, and it's kind of like I can make suggestions about how I think things should be fixed, but people are free to take that or not, you know? Uh, I think in that, that movable type flaw in particular, that three-step rendering, that had something to do with like the old style templates in movable type. I think, I honestly don't know. I've never used it when with anything other than template toolkit, but I think there are some legacy setups where like HTML template couldn't do the make text and so it needed a separate stage for that. Um, but that's, that's, that is frequently the case though, that if you present an exploit, you get a fix for the exploit not the collection of problems that went into it. And in the worst case, the fix for the exploit will be the most cosmetic fix. Uh, that happens sometimes, you know, but you can turn right around and say, well, look, your fix for this didn't work because this. Um, there's actually a great example in, in movable type recently that Nathaniel Rubin, the, the guy that did the, the what talks, uh, the same sort of problems that he found in Bugzilla, he also found in movable type. Uh, and I did a, a walkthrough of how those problems worked at the Houston Pearl Mongers, and in the process of walking through it, it was like, yeah, this fixed up part. So I reported another vulnerability, exact same area, exact same method uh, with, with that. Um, yeah. any, any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. Uh, so the the question is whether I I follow up when I report a vulnerability that the fix is there and that the fix works and everything. Uh, uh, in the best case, say like if you want to be the best possible person to deal with it, when somebody reports a vulnerability to to you, 
you would actually let them see the fix before you ship it. Uh, send them the, what you're going to send out. Send them what the announcement is going to say and see what they have to say about it. Uh, you, there's no guarantee they're going to look at it and test it really well, but, but you're giving them that opportunity to voice complaints that this is not actually going to correct it. Uh, and some, some people do that, uh, and some people don't. You know? And you basically wait a couple months, they put out a release, you look at it, and you're like, yeah, you, that totally doesn't work. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, it happens. You know? and, and to be honest, like at, at cPanel, sometimes we spend a lot of time fixing a problem, we put it out, and then a week or two goes by and we look at our stuff again and it's like, they're, yeah, we made mistakes. You know, like, I mean, the, the reality is everybody makes mistakes. And so that's, that's not a terrible thing. I do try to go back and look at the fixes after, after they come out. But in some cases, like I will look at software that I really don't use. Uh, and especially if I have a, a less than positive interaction with the people that wrote the software, then I generally won't follow it up, uh, especially if I don't use it, you know? Like, why, why would I invest in something that, that I don't use, you know, and that I'm not having a good back and forth, you know? Uh, any, any other questions? No? Uh, so the question is like, if I have that sort of bad back and forth, will I search for alternatives? Absolutely. Uh, personally, yes. I, uh, when I find software that over and over again in, in me looking at it, I feel like it's not written very well, uh, or that in talking with those people, I feel that they are not exactly being, being honest partners in, in how they interact with everybody in the chain, uh, then yes, I will avoid their software. Um, well, I, I, I don't, I don't want to call anybody out. Yeah, but, uh, um, and 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 you know, don't don't read into that any specific group or anything like that. Uh, that I, 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 but definitely, in everybody gets their gut feelings about uh, about these sorts of things. I, I will tell you one thing. Like, um, it used to be popular that once a year you would hear these reports about, oh well. Microsoft had this many CVEs, and the Linux kernel had this many CVEs, and this web server had this many CVEs. That really doesn't mean much of anything, you know? Like, the, the people that are actually being proactive and fixing things, they're gonna report more vulnerabilities, you know? That means that they're actually looking for them, you know? Uh, so, the fact that something never has a security problem is not a good sign that there's not one, you know? That just means nobody's looking for it, or, they're, when people do report them, that they sort of go into a black hole and nobody ever sees them on the other side. Um, any, any other, anything else? No? Okay. Uh, any, do we have a bug bounty program? Yes, at cPanel we do have a bug bounty program. Uh, I honestly don't ha know the URL, but if you Google it, it will pop right up. Our bug bounty program covers our product. Uh, and like I said, like when things are reported to cPanel, we tend to, we try to read those reports in the most liberal possible way and, and imagine, you know, like the maximum extent of what somebody could do with it. Uh, our software though is like shared hosting management software. So it has a very unique attack profile where like somebody could already be on the system to start off being the attacker. Um, but uh, if, it, if it interests you, definitely look into it, you know. All right, well, uh, thanks a lot for coming on. Yeah.